reason might have missed it and want some, to, some access to it. So it's recording as we go. Um, David, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, Thanks, Trevor. Someone and you're in charge. As, hi, guys. Thanks for being with me, um, especially at what I consider to be quite an early time of the day. I know Trevor's an early bird. But um, uh, what I'm going to do today is talk to you for about 30 minutes. And then if you've got time, I'm more than happy to um, take any questions. I'll also give you my email address too, should you have questions that you'd like to address offline. Um, but what I thought we'd do before we talk about having those critical conversations is I'd like to give you a little bit of background about myself. And please understand this is not for um, uh, pity or for self-bragging rights. It's just to establish some credibility in the subject that I'm talking about. And I'm also going to do you a big favour because rather than having my uh, ugly big mug on the screen for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to with graphic imagery. So if you don't mind, if you will give me just a couple of minutes, I'll just get my slides up. David, while you're doing that, Tack, can you mute your morning. microphone, please? You're the, you're the feedback guy at the moment. Now, can you tell me, ah, we've all seen those slides, all right? Yep. It's fantastic. You should see a group of very suave-looking people there. Um, now, I've uh, spent my career, which is, oh, I hate to say, but nearly 40 years now, working in advertising as a writer. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen the TV show Mad Men, which was all about advertising in the 1960s. But let me assure you, my life was never anywhere as glamorous as this. Never drank a bottle of scotch before lunch, nor smoked three packets of cigarettes a day. But that said, I've worked in very large national agencies, and I've even run my own agency. And throughout all this time, I've suffered from a mental illness, which is sometimes referred to as a roller coaster. And that mental illness is called bipolar one. And the reason it's called a roller coaster ride is because it comes with absolute suicidal lows and absolutely manic highs. And I think the best way to describe one of these manic highs is that it's like stepping aboard a Saturn V rocket. After months of depression, I'll start to feel normal again. And I start to feel pretty good. And then I start to feel a little too good. And the next thing I know, I hear a countdown in my head, a roar of engines in my ears, and I'm heading off to the stars. Each morning, I will jump from bed at 3 or 4 a.m. feeling amazingly fresh, really, really full of it. And by the time the rest of Australia is considering getting out of bed, I've done a day's work. I once wrote a book in about three months while holding down a really high pressure job. And it was an absolute work of genius, or so I thought at the time. I um, reread it about well, a year ago, and I'm here to tell you quite honestly, it's crap. But during my highs, I have an amazing confidence and I can do nothing wrong. So my dog loves the uh, presentation. Just being quiet at the moment. But as I said, during these highs, I'm incredibly, credibly confident and I can do nothing wrong, even though my wife keeps muttering something about no jury in the country would ever convince me. And when I look in the mirror, I see a combination of these two blokes. Rather than a short, grey-haired man in his 60s looking back at me. However, a few months later, my engines cough and they splutter and then they fall eerily quiet. And the next thing I know, I'm hurtling back to, to earth at great speed. I crash through the roof of my home and I land perfectly on my bed in the deepest of depressions. And to make matters worse, to make matters worse, given my arrogance and my behaviour during these many highs, Sympathy isn't all that easy to find. Consequently, with a mental illness like this, I know what it's like to be driven by anxieties that are so strong that I've sacrificed weekend after weekend to need this work. 
I know what it's like to be so sleep deprived. So sleep deprived. Uh, to be so sleep deprived. I'm just getting a bit of feedback on my. So, are you guys getting feedback? Well? Uh, Tack, can you mute your microphone, please? It's you're the one that's bouncing it back, mate. Thank you. you should be okay. Right. Uh, so, I, and also thanks to these uh, mental illness, I know what it's like to be so sleep deprived that my keyboard often resembled a soft downy pillow. And I know what it's like to perform brilliantly in a boardroom one minute, only to find myself crying quietly in a toilet cubicle the next. In fact, I even know what it's like to have spent three weeks, spent three weeks in a mood disorder. At first, I pictured a run-down gothic mansion, lit by lightning and with barred windows from which blood curdling screams of the criminal insane could be heard. The fact of the matter was, it was more like a bit of a run-down travel lodge but for pretty obvious reasons, without the bar or the swimming pool. It was, however, filled with great staff and even better fellow patients. <clears throat> and this was actually a shot of my room. Now, I mentioned this day for one simple reason. When my psychiatrist suggested I could benefit from hospitalisation, I was absolutely devastated. Such clinics were for the seriously ill, not me. The truth is I was judging my fellow patients in the same way that many normal Australians would judge me. I was judging from a position of absolute ignorance. <clears throat> Thankfully, I was 100% wrong about these people. You see, like too many, like me and too many of us Australians, we judge from a point of ignorance and we judge too quickly. People with mental illnesses are not to be pitied and they're not to be scared of. As I well know, many can be incredibly strong and incredibly successful. But for all of this, my life's been, on the other side, very, very normal and very wonderful. While the failure rate for most bipolar marriages is just over 93%, I'm lucky enough to have been married to the same wonderful woman for 37 years. Now, <clears throat> some say that this is proof that my wife is an angel. But sometimes I just tend to wonder whether she's been too busy to have ever looked around. I also have two wonderful daughters who bear my occasional love behaviour with good grace and savage humour. And plus, until recently, I had one of the greatest mental health tools known to mankind, and that was a dog named Benny. <clears throat> this was an image of him taken during his HSC and he's studying there at his desk. Um, and I'm here to tell you, between you and I, he actually did far better than I am. Um, I also live in a lovely, leafy Sydney suburb and enjoy the occasional... Well, I used to enjoy the occasional Sydney holiday. So life's been good, but it's also been a hell of a struggle. When I was a young man in my 20s, I saw a psychiatrist about my moods. And while it wasn't Sigmund Freud, it may as well have been. I was so disillusioned with the experience that I decided as only a typical young macho male could, that would, I would be better off handling my mental health myself. And that's exactly what I did for the next 25 years. It was the dumbest decision of my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. 15 years ago, I did what I should have done straight after my first psychiatric appointment. I consulted another psychiatrist. Now, this is not a photo of the psychiatrist, but symbolic of how he made me feel. He helped me finally get my life back in some sort of order. Now, if there's only one thing you take from this presentation today, please make it this. If you're not feeling well, or you sense you have a friend or a colleague or a family member who's not travelling all that well, do something about it. Don't be like me and waste years of your life or risk a friend's life thinking that it will magically fix itself. Just do something. See your GP or at least speak to that person you may be concerned about. <clears throat> Speaking of which, let's look at how to have that conversation if you're concerned about a colleague, or for that matter, a friend or family matter. And that's whether it's whether you're face to face or whether you're screen to screen. 
Let me start by saying that during even the best of times, 20% of adult Australians will suffer from some form of mental illness. That's one in five of us, which equates to about 3 million adult Australians. Clearly, I would say that right now that figure is probably far, far higher. But the truly worrying statistic that is all of these, that of all of these people, only one third of them will actually raise their hands and ask for help. The other two thirds, in other words, two million Australians roughly, won't say a word. They'll just simply stay in hiding. <clears throat> and they do so for a whole bunch of reasons. So if you suspect something, you should ask because you may be just prompting that person to seek help, or who knows, you even may be starting them on a process that actually saves their life. Now, you might think that having such a discussion may be highly embarrassing for both of you. But if you do it right, I promise you, it won't be in the slightest. The other thing to remember is that things have changed so much in the last six months that it seems a far more natural thing to do nowadays. In fact, your mates may think you're a hard bugger if you don't inquire as to their health for every now and then. All right, imagine I have a bunch of friends that I work with. <clears throat> We're just workmates. You know, we have the occasional cup of coffee together, but nothing more than that. Now lately, I've been getting a sense that my mate, Jennifer Aniston, hasn't been feeling all that well. She hasn't been her chirpy self. And when I talk to her by Zoom or phone, she seems a little flat. She's even a little bit irritable with me at times. Some other friends have mentioned this too. And it's really, really unlike her. She also seems dark quite a bit. And while she normally looks well-groomed and beautiful, she's starting to look a little disheveled. In short, I'm a little bit worried. And I say so I've decided I'm going to talk to her. So the first thing I do is I think how I'm going to approach her. I don't just blunder into a conversation. I think about it before I approach her. Will I Zoom or will I ring her? Or if we're back at work, will I ask her out for a coffee by herself? What would she be most comfortable with? And if she's at home, I'll also consider what time is best for her. When does she have time that she can be alone and private? I also want to do this when I have a good amount of time. There's nothing worse than asking somebody how they're traveling and saying you're a bit concerned with them. And they say, well, I'm not traveling all that well. And you say, right, let's schedule some time for next week. You have to allow for the fact that they may answer and go, I'm not well, and you need to be dedicating as much time then as they need. So let's imagine that Jennifer and I are back at work and I decide for the privacy sake, it would be good to have a chat in one of the old meeting rooms that no one goes past. The first thing I want to do is reassure Jennifer that this conversation has nothing to do with her work performance. And here's how the conversation goes. Hey, Jen, look, I just wanted to have a chat in private. with you. This has got nothing to do with work. It's just that I've been a little bit concerned about you. You just don't seem to be yourself at the moment. You just seem a little flat, even a little irritable from time to time. And you seem tired all the time. I mean, even Joey's noticed. And that's it. I don't waffle on and on and on. And better still, I've left the discussion open-ended. I didn't just ask straight out, are you okay? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not criticising are you okay, fantastic organisation but it's not really the way to start a proper conversation about somebody's mental health. It's just too easy if I say, hey, Jen, are you, are, are you okay? And she's too easy for her to say, yes, I am. And suddenly the conversation's coming to an end. What I've done by simply opening up the, the discussion and leaving it open-ended is prompting her to actually have to have a conversation with me to at least talk a little bit to me. <clears throat> now, to my mind, this conversation has three possible outcomes, none of which are going to be embarrassing. And that first outcome is, 
I have misread the situation. Jennifer says to me that she actually feels remarkably well given everything she's going through. She's just been flat out and a bit tired because of the kids, but she feels fine mentally. And that's it. Jennifer is not the slightest embarrassed, bit embarrassed that I've asked her. In fact, she actually thinks I'm a really good bloke for caring enough to ask about it. <coughs> Excuse me. The second option is desire. And this is the fact that I asked this Jennifer how she's traveling. And she says to me, I feel fine. I've just been a little bit tired and irritable at the moment because I've been flat out. But I'm absolutely fine. Now, what she's doing is lying straight to my face, but that's fine. And it's possibly the most likely outcome that you ever have in a discussion like this, especially in an initial discussion. But the good thing is you've actually achieved something really well here. Firstly, you've let Jennifer know that somehow you've noticed that perhaps her, her acting ability is not quite as good as she thought it was because you've seen through the veneer. But the really important thing is you've opened a door for her. If Jenna thinks, wow, like I'm really concerned about my health, you've opened a door through which she can step back in a week or two and go, hey, Dave, you know when we had that conversation? Well, guess what? I'm not feeling all that well. Now, at this point, she's not in the slightest bit embarrassed once again. In fact, she thinks you're a really, really good friend for having bothered to ask. She really thinks you're special. Um, the third scenario is this. Thank God you asked. Now, in this case, Jennifer just comes straight out and tells me that she has been feeling terrible. She feels sad or highly anxious all the time, far more than she would have expected to. And she's not sleeping well at the moment. She's so glad she finally has a chance to talk about it. And rather than any embarrassment, Jennifer thinks I'm the best bloke in the world and decides to rename one of her kids after me, even if it's a girl. In this case, having started the conversation, I'll let her talk as much as she wants and all I do is sit back and listen. After all, I'm not a psychologist or a GP or a psychiatrist, so I'm not really in a position to offer advice, but I am in a great position to offer my support and to listen. Now, if she's telling me things that are patently untrue as she thinks no one loves her or that she's useless or that worry, she's worried that she's going to get, the job, get sacked when you know fully well she's a key part of the business. You don't challenge her on it. You don't go, oh, that's rubbish. Everybody loves you. Because what you'd actually be doing in a position like that is making her feel a little worse. She actually thinks, oh, even David thinks I'm crazy. What you do in a situation that, like that, if somebody's coming out with stuff that's patently untrue, all you say to them is, it must be terrible to feel that way. It must be really, really lousy to feel that way, but we can seek help. <clears throat> and that's it. I've really, really made it that easy. I've just been honest. I've started with an open question. To her. Well, it's not a question, I've just opened an open statement and I've allowed her to respond to me. Now, sitting back with my mouth shut fear, for fear of embarrassment is a waste of time and energy and it's possibly going to, it's possibly even could take Jennifer's life. Okay, so that in a very simple form is how to check in on your mates if you're concerned about their welfare. Now, let's take a, a look at a few things that might help you maintain, you maintain your own well-being during these difficult times. And the first two are a couple of relaxation exercises that we're going to do, and um, they come from the East. And the, I think the funny thing about 
They say the Western world is concerned with the exterior, the Eastern world concerned with the interior. And the first thing we do is going to learn to do a little bit of belly breathing. The nice thing is because we're all at home, we're all by ourselves, we won't feel embarrassed as what others might think. Now, the fact of the matter is when we normally go about our daily chores, we breathe from right up here. We breathe from up here. We don't walk around sucking the air deep into our, our diaphragm and right down into our lungs. <clears throat> but what happens when we're breathing from up here, when we encounter slightly stressful situations, we tend to breathe quicker. And the physiological fact is that the quicker we breathe and the more shallow we breathe, the less oxygen we get into our system. So I'm just going to teach you a very, very simple lesson that you can use to calm yourself at any time during the day. In fact, you can just pick it up and use it as a well-being exercise a few times during the day. And what we're going to do is breathe really, really deeply. We're going to breathe so deeply that we actually bring our diaphragm into play. We're going to fill our lungs so that we can fill our diaphragm in our belly. And what I'm going to do is close my mouth. Well, I won't because I have to talk, but you're going to close your mouth. And you're going to breathe very slowly for about four seconds and you're going to inhale. So you're just going to go and suck that right back so that you can actually feel it down in your belly. And then you're going to hold that breath for a few seconds, just comfortably. You don't have to turn blue. And then very slowly, you're going to exhale it. So Come on, everybody, let's try that. And Trevor, I'm watching you, so you've got to do this too, all right? Yeah. Do it again. Now, I promise you, if you do that for a few meetings before a big appointment or a sales pitch or whatever, you will feel far, far calmer. And this is not something from Eastern mystique or something. This is just physiological because what you've just been doing is dragging a heap of oxygen into the system. What you've been doing by breathing slowly is slowing your heart rate. You've lowered your blood pressure. And with doing so, you actually feel physically calmer. Now, I can promise you, even if you don't have some stressful event, if you try that a few times during the day, you can try it sitting at traffic lights. You can try it sitting at your desk. It's great. And that basic breathing is the very basis of every meditation known to mankind throughout the world. You can do any meditation from that, but meditation stems basically from breathing exercises. The second little exercise I'm going to do is a mindfulness exercise. And to my mind, um, when I was first introduced to these things, I used to think this was all for, you had to wear cheesecloth and have a goatee beard and smoke that. I really did not believe much in these things. But they are fantastic for helping you feel calmer. Let's look at the imagery on the screen, the time months. Now, when I flicked that image up, I bet you went, oh, yeah, look, a bunch of smiling time marks. That's as much as you probably recorded. You're probably listening to me and phasing out and thinking, what time is this guy going to finish and all that sort of stuff. But take a look at these months. If we were to look at this image for a minute, we would notice amazing things. We'd notice, well, firstly, you might count the number of months in it. And at first, it looks like there's five or six. But if you really count it, I, don't, I can't see properly because the Brady Bunch on the right-hand side is obscuring my screen. But there's probably about 12 monks in this. They're obviously sitting in front of some temple. Uh, and it's a beautiful temple. There's snakes waving around. Looks like dragons on them. And so on and so on. The longer I would look at that picture, the more and more I would see. Now, you don't have to have an image of time months to be able to do this. You could simply look at any object on your desk or you could look at a tree. Now, you look at a tree and you go, oh, it's a tree. There it is, some green leaves, some brown branches. 
if you really look, you might you start to see things. You'll see the texture of the bark. You'll see possibly a bird's nest. Things that you haven't noticed before. But the object is not to become an expert on Thai monks or to become an expert on um, trees. What's happened here while you've been studying this image is that you've kicked your mind out of gear. You've given it a little relaxation. While you're focusing on those monks, you haven't been thinking about your next appointment. You haven't been thinking about, oh, I've got to invoice uh, this afternoon, I've really got to get that invoice. So you haven't been worried about, oh, I wonder if that's going to turn into a bad debt or I've got to pick the kids up from school. Your mind has actually been kicked into neutral. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do for it because it's like a football game. It's a refresher for it. If you do that a few times during the day, you'll feel so much better and you'll actually perform your activity far, far better. Now, <clears throat> the other thing we can do, especially during these times, and it might sound a little strange, it is volunteer, or at least have a voluntary frame of mind. I'm not suggesting that we all suddenly throw in our businesses and that we all run off and help join the Red Cross. And, but especially during these times, we can help other people. And the fact of the matter is, and once again, this is not guesswork. There's study after study around the world that shows people that volunteer or at least have that attitude towards life, who think of others as much as themselves, live longer, feel calmer and have better mental health. Now, I know at the moment it's not that easy to volunteer, but there's still the lady down the street the old lady who finds it hard to get out to the shops and doesn't like fighting over toilet paper or whatever. There's no reason why you can't suggest to that person that you can ring them or go past them and say, would you like me to pick something up from the shops for you? There's no reason why even if we're in full lockdown, you can't leave the stuff on the steps for her. There's no reason why you can't help walk a local dog that um, the old person's too old to be able to take to the park anymore. It's a really simple thing to do. And I think we all know it's true. If you ever walked past a homeless person and you've given them a dollar, or better still, you've been really feeling great and you've given them $5, you know fully well that you felt good about yourself. You know fully well that for five minutes after doing that, you feel really, really good. Okay. One more quick tip, and this is very good for us, especially for those of us who may be working from home. I don't know how many are, there are, you may be in your offices, but for many of us, we're still working from home. And it's this, it's leaving work for the day. And it's very easy for us to be at our desks at 7.30 in the morning in our pyjamas or our um, Luke Skywalker vests or whatever, and to sit down and go, right, I better check the emails. Slip out, have a quick cup of coffee, grab your, um, grab your breakfast, be back at your emails. Be working, 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 working. And I think the actual fact is that for those of us at the moment, we're working in unusual circumstances. I think we're actually working harder than we ever have because we don't have the time for the interaction with other people, whether they be staff members. We don't have the interaction going, right, I'm just gonna sit down in the coffee shop. Uh, who wants coffee? Um, we don't have time for those things, so we fill it with work. So what I'm suggesting is at the start of the day, no matter how busy you may find yourself, you set yourself a knockoff time. And you set yourself that knockoff time in the morning and you set it on your, my, on your mobile phone so it's going to remind you that it's time to stop work. And what happens at that time, your alarm goes off and you stop work, you shut down your computer, and what you do is you get up and you actually walk out of your room and then you walk out of your home or your apartment or wherever. And you walk out and you walk down the street and you find a private little place. And this applies even if you're on the way home, if you've been working out of your business. You find a private spot and you sit down and you put your feet firmly on the ground and you sit upright and you do five minutes of that belly breathing I told you about. It will kick you out of work mode and put you into a far more relaxed mode, after which 
walk up to your front door, you knock on the door, you say, honey, I'm home or whatever, who answers the door for you, a flatmate or whatever, and you walk in and you go down and sit in your lounge or do whatever you would normally do when you get home from work. Okay, and this is the very end. Let's talk very, very quickly about isolation. Isolation is a great way to kill off COVID. We all know that by now. But it's a terrible, terrible way um, for mental health. It really actually encourages mental health issues. So what I'm saying, I mean, mental illnesses thrive on isolation. When people or suffer from depression or anxiety, they tend to withdraw from society to alienate themselves from others. So what I'm suggesting, and I know you've probably heard this a thousand, thousand times, it is for you to actually make sure that you keep in touch with people, staff members or friends or family, make that effort to pick up the phone. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been actually getting lazier in doing this. But I was talking about how busy we we're working. Stop it. Take 10 minutes off to ring a friend. Say, how are you going? What's happening? Take time to connect with other people and not just through Zoom, because I don't know about you, but a lot of people are starting to get Zoom now. And that is it, guys. I hope it's been of um, some assistance. And with that, I am going to stop sharing this screen. And ask you if there are any questions that you may have. Just uh, unmute your mics and ask away, folks. We'll, um, Carlos, I think you typed something in the chat box. Did you have a question? Good morning. How are you guys? Hey, Carlos. Um, I've got a question. Uh, thank you very much, David, for the presentation. Not at all, mate. Mate, what do you do with a with a friend or a work colleague that um, obviously you know them very well? Yep. Um, you know that there's something going on. Yep. In denial and don't want to open up and don't want to talk. Do you just let it go and walk away, or? Yeah. Look, you can't you can't nag somebody into seeking help. In fact, you nag too much, you may drive them further into their own shell. But what you can do is you can stay in touch with them in terms of that. Mm. You know, you can do it in a couple of weeks' time. The other thing you can do, without being too blatantly pain in the backside, but is you can offer them tips for how people can seek help. You might suggest, look, I don't know, I haven't been feeling all that well, you know. Look, if you, if you ever want to see a GP or something, you know, like... I'd be more than happy to come along. Even though they're saying, no, no, there's nothing wrong. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to get them angry with you and going, oh, shut the hell up. But you can offer them those sort of tips. Or you might be a good leaflet on, on um, how to avoid depression or anxiety, for example. Preventative stuff, rather than suggesting that they've got it. And, and one other thing I'll just say, but... People with depression are 30% more likely to seek help um, if they are prompted by somebody else. No, actually, that figure, sorry, it's far higher than that. So the very fact that you may prompt somebody and say, you're not looking well, blah, 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 there's still a far higher chance that eventually they will than if you just totally ignore them. Does that sort of answer your question? Yes, it does, David. Thank you. Cool, mate. Cool. David, can I Tanya, ask you? Tanya, you've got your hand up. Yes, yeah, I'll lower my hand. Hi, David. Um, great presentation, first of all. Thank you very um, much. The question I have for you is more, as we've got a lot of small businesses uh, all over the country yeah. who are feeling the pressures of finance, et cetera, and what eventually happens to them, they get foggy or they freeze because yeah. the stress is overwhelming. And one yes. of the fears attached with all that stress is also a fear of failure or letting down their families or their dependents or their employees. Of course. So one of the questions I have is, Obviously, and I'll put my hand up. I'm one of those people who will never ask for help. Yep, yep. Most of us are. Yep. So 
what tools would you recommend giving to a small business owner who is going through these stresses and feeling the anxiety and the depression, et cetera, to get through their haze and to start to focus because there's too many problems. What we want them to focus on is what's the most important right now? What's the most important thing? And get them yeah, to start yeah, yeah. through that. Yeah, and I think a tendency, I mean, I, I'm a small business. I'm a one-man band yep. or two, two, two people band, my wife and I. Um, but and so I, lost I absolutely you. understand and empathise with that. The first thing I think is that we tend, we tend the, the, the bigger the problem seems, the more we throw time at it and we're not necessarily throwing effective time at it. You know, we're, we're getting ourselves so tired. In some ways, I think um, the encouragement to pull away a little bit to try and as much as these things are overwhelming, especially at the moment, and for business owners at any time, but especially now, but to try and ignore it for an hour or two here or there, to get some exercise, to do some of those basic little things like we just talked about, belly breathing and mindfulness and stuff. And, and those things get really bad names because they, for a lot of people, especially blokes, I think they go, oh, why would I be doing that? Yeah, that's ridiculous. You know, I'm strong. I don't need that sort of stuff. Is the, the, to try to encourage to get away a little bit from it because as I think as we all know, often when you come back to a problem after you refresh yourself a bit or even while you're away from that problem, things start to pop into your head and go, hang on, hang on. I don't know you, about you. I find it a bit of an annoying thing, but I often go to bed and I'll be lying in bed when you're supposed to go. And I'm not particularly worried about things, but things will pop into my head and go, oh, I've really got to mention to that contact that I do this or that, or I can offer them this service. So I think if you can encourage them not to be working harder, not to be going right now, this week I'm going to work seven hours, because that's what run themselves into the ground. And that stress, that stress needs a circuit breaker somehow. And a bit of exercise or just even a beer with a friend can be a circuit breaker like that. Um, but the worst thing they can do is just throw themselves harder and harder and harder at it. Because you get to the point where you're just not being effective whatsoever. And that, that mountain only feels bigger and higher and you know, climb. And the other thing I was, and please, I'm not trying to teach you to suck eggs, but is to, I find it really, really helpful. You write the whole bloody thing down and then you break it into bits and pieces and you go, today I'm doing this piece. What's the most important piece I can do today rather than having everything and going, I have everything. These are all super important. Is that and, and, you're, no, and you're right. And that's what we have to encourage business because they do freeze. Um, because mm. of the stresses, and we don't want them to. No, no, any stress like that. And I think the natural natural reaction is, thanks, Bill, not at all, mate. Um, the natural reaction is, oh well, I just work hard, and we're not working harder at all. We're 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 working harder at time, but not not effectiveness. Jenny, did you have a question? Yeah, I actually just want to. Um give you a little bit of an insight from um, somebody who has suffered debilitating depression. Um, as a business owner, you're getting told a lot of things. So what I find is, and especially business people, are the people who are the decision makers. So, and I know this is particular with um with men as well and entrepreneurs is you need to be the one to make that decision. So I find that if you maybe say to people, I have a friend who um, takes this medication, uh, meditation, not medication, meditation yeah. course X, Y, Z, or something that I've done recently, I have enrolled in a meditation course and invited a couple of people I know who are stressing and said, I'm doing this course if you're interested. So when people have or feel depression, a lot of people are very good at putting up a wall that there is nothing wrong. But if they are the ones to hear a story about 
a good coffee shop or hear a story about something, they are the ones to make the decision to say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to start here. I'm going to call somebody else. So partaking personal um, stories to people or stories about other people so that they can make those decisions. I find that oh, that's really I, good. That's great advice, Jenny. That, and especially like you can open up to people. And but, but what you're suggesting there is somebody goes, well, Jenny's doing that, maybe I'll go along with her. Absolutely, yeah. That's gives right. them that. And, and it's, it's, it's like I said in the talk, it's opening that door a little bit. And yep. so finally at some stage they can go, Jenny, would you mind? I just really got to talk about something. Absolutely, absolutely. Great, great advice, mate. Yeah, and it took me probably 49 years, <laughs> maybe 48 years to be able to publicly admit that I have suffered depression for 30 years. Yeah, um, you're in good so company, it, mate. It takes a long, it takes a long time. Um, so, yeah, some people don't understand it themselves or will not undo that wall or admit it. So, um, yeah, mainly because I feel, because the other person does not know, 99% does not know how that feels, does no. not really want to know how that feels. So, um, Unless you've been there, I think, it's probably like war vets, you know, like war vets. 100%. Or to talk about something because they know there'll be the, the, the real empathy there. 100%. Yes. So, um, yeah, just, just being there. Sometimes just having someone sit there on the, uh, the op opposite you in a cafe and say nothing is sometimes just enough. Absolutely. Can I, and also, for guys, if you've got a problem, and a guy, um, often guys don't want to sit across from each other. And if you're talking mental health problems, you're not allowed to do it over a beer because that only after four beers go, hey, we're all fine, love you, love you, <laughs> see you later. What you can do with a fellow bloke is go for a walk around the block or the park. The car. I always find for blokes um, having a chat in the car where you're not face to face. Yeah, that's and it. You don't, you're not doing this. You're not looking directly into eyes. If a guy wants to have it like he's a bit, bit weepy or whatever um, and the whole problem is out there then it's not between us can i ask you both a question jenny and and david because yeah. one thing david you touched on in your presentation which i think is very important a lot of people we don't acknowledge what the cause of their stress like what you said is i feel useless i feel um they're not they're going to fire me for whatever and someone will always say no you're not you're valued Yes. So we're not given permission to mourn or to grieve. Yes. And then to recover. So do you think that's a really key factor? So even in our business, because a lot of people are going to close their business, they should be allowed to grieve or mourn or express it without us passing judgment by saying, no, you're not. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So I say to Jenny, Jenny says, I'm really depressed. I'm this, I'm that. Nobody loves me. Uh, I'm a useless business person, blah, blah, blah. And I immediately say, no, that's rubbish, Jenny. Jenny goes, it's like, Jenny goes, oh. You're not listening. You're not you're listening. Not listening. Yeah. You, you, and I feel worse now. But you're right. People are allowed to do that and you're allowed to say to people, it must be horrible to feel like that. It must be lousy. You don't have to say, I know exactly how you feel because you probably don't. Yeah. Would you approach it then by saying, look, I, I, I'm sorry you feel that way. So what is it that you want? How can I help you? Or what would you, what do you want to do? How can I help you is often a great one. You know, mm. this is especially true of blokes. Your car's not running well and you haven't got a mechanic. You go, I need a mechanic. Every guy will have the world's best mechanic. They'll all go, oh, I'll tell you where you got to go. You got to go here. Bloody tell them I sent you and blah, blah, blah. We've all got advice on that. We don't know anything about mental health issues. And I've like, I'm buried in the stuff, but I, I, I know very little, you know, I touch on the tip of the iceberg. <coughs> asking that, <coughs> excuse me, asking that person, how can I help you, gives them the control. And they may know. 
that person, if they've been in that situation before, if they've got severe anxiety, or whatever, they may go, I need this to do this or that. And you're helping them encourage that. But you're giving them a sense of control. They're not some useless little kid that you're going, right, here, this is what we're going to do, because you don't know. You really don't know. Actually, David, that, yeah. sorry, go on. No, I was just going to, very quickly, one thing that you both said is a very important thing is the word how. So when you say to somebody, can I help you? Your automatic response is, no, I'm fine. How was your day? Yes, I'm good. They're the, they're the, the questions that we don't, but adding the word how, people have to answer you. So can I help you? No, I'm fine. How can I help you? And wait. And that, that word how really changes the delivery and the acceptance of that question. Very true. Uh, it, yeah. it, it does. It does. I've, I've used I, it. I'd like, I'd like to also add, I think also one thing you need to be careful is, what we also need to be careful is in that situation, every, all your points you guys have made have been valid, but one thing when somebody is in that sort of zone, if you want to call it, well, let's call it the zone, the worst thing they want to do is be lectured to as well or made to be feel that they're being told something that it's the worst because what that to me is effectively, especially if you misread the signs or misread, uh, it, it, it's, it's not an attack on the, the person that's actually asking, but it's the worst feeling it can be is to be lectured to at a time when you, you're seeing nothing but black or negativity. Uh, you, know, it's, you appreciate the, the concern, but I think, one trick you, not, you need to be careful about is not to lecture, or be seen to be lecturing that person on how to fix it. Precisely. Or, mm. Yeah, unless, unless you've got something. a psychiatric degree, Tony. What's that? Unless you've got a psychiatric degree. Exactly, yes, yeah. exactly. No, that's so true. You're there as support. You're there as two big, two big ears, shoulder, somebody to offer you, look, you know, if they're really close friends, you might even go, would you like CGP? Would you like me to come along with you? You know, and it's especially like people go, some people go, that would be fantastic. But you, you're so true, Tony. Our job is not to become experts, to, to tell people what to do. Eric, it's just to be support. 100%. 100%. David, can I just ask in your experience, let's hypothetically now we've got a <coughs> colleague at work who, who clearly yep. needed some help. We've had that conversation. And uh, you want to suggest the next step for them. It, we, we know of names like Lifeline, um, Black Dog Institute, Beyond Blue and so on. Is there a, an ideal next step or is it not a one size fits all? The, the, no, I, the, the ideal starting step, I think, is, is care lines are great and they're great if you're not too bad or if you're really bad, like Lifeline, you know, but... The, the, what you would be doing in a situation where somebody's open to help is encouraging them to see a GP, but also and you may be involved in helping them in this, but encouraging them to see a GP that knows a bit about mental health because mm. not all GPs know as much as others. So yeah. you want to, and I think good GPs nowadays, you can actually ring up, well, you could ring up a centre and go, who's your best person on this? Or you can speak to your, your own doctor and go, um, look, do you know much about this? They might go, not a lot, but my colleague, blah, blah, does. And that's what you want. And that's your starting set because what happens is that GP, a good one, will become your um, fulcrum, your like catalyst for going, oh, well, maybe you need to speak to a psychologist or maybe you need heavier medication. Maybe you need to see a psychiatrist. Or, but they'll become your catalyst and they'll become your go-to person for all this expertise. And if you like that GP, chances are you'll like all the people they're referring you. So that's, that's a big thing, Trevor. That's a great starting point. Or don't get me wrong, all the call centres that if you've got... I've... I've had problems for other people. I've run Lifeline, not as a crisis thing. Lifeline will talk to you about anything to do with mental health. You don't have to be suicidal or anything. And I've said, look, I've got a friend whose boyfriend took his own life, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, what should she do in seeking some help? And they were fantastic. And they love it when people are ringing and going, I want some advice because it gives them a time for these crisis support workers to relax a little bit and go, right, here's, here's what we'll do, you know, and show their expertise. But a GP, nine times out of 10, I would say, is a great place to start. Sorry, to add to that too, though, my thoughts would be is a lot of people will get into these mental health issues because they've got a trigger. So in this instance, we're having COVID, so a lot of businesses under financial stress mm. and all of that. So the first thing would be is you ch try and change your situation or put those coping mechanisms that you spoke about, which is meditation, walking, running before you start going off to GPs and having medication prescribed to you. Which it, it, Oh, yeah. and Well, I'm not suggesting for a minute, Tanya, that... A good GP will not go, right, here's, here's a script, run off, take these pills. A good GP um, could help you with cognitive thinking, like how you approach your thinking, whether you're thinking, you know, like it's the classic old glass half full, half empty sort of thing. A good GP will often discuss a lot of things that we've been discussing more this morning, um, which is why you want somebody to who knows a bit about mental health, because if they don't, they're more than likely to go, here's a script for some happy pills. Off you go. That's that's not helping you. That's just putting a, you know, a Band-Aid on it for a moment. And if financial problems, which is a, one of the big catalysts at the moment, the GP can prescribe a mental health plan, which can give you anything from five to 10 free sessions with a therapist. So sometimes people don't seek further medical help, physical or mental, because of the perceived cost. Um, so they can get medi uh, uh, mental health plan um, uh, referral to a, someone to speak to. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a really, really useful point. Thanks, Jenny, for that one. That's a well, guys, we need to, to wrap up because we're getting close to nine o'clock. David, on behalf of everyone and, of course, for the Business Chamber, thank you so much for your you. very generous time today and a fantastic presentation. You can, thank uh, you for your insights. You not, 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 not at all. I, look, I, I'd just like to say thank you very much, guys. It's been great discussion. Often the best things that these are not in the talk, but discussion after. And we, we will... Uh, Make sure that David's contact details uh, are provided. We'll have it up on our website uh, and, uh, and other matters as well, if anyone would like to follow up and get in contact with David. Uh, yeah. Our next workshop is the third Thursday, and I can't remember the date, in September. And uh, we're still keeping on this, um, this sort of theme as to how we're coping uh, during this time. And it's going to be focusing as Jenny, as you just raised actually on the financial aspects of your business at this time, remembering that JobKeeper was originally going to end at the end of September and uh, it's now going to change at the end of September. So Tony uh, Badua from uh, Elite Finance, whose face is there on the screen at the moment, is going to be presenting our workshop in September, uh, focusing on all of those issues that businesses need to focus on at this time, particularly with that change to JobKeeper and how it's going to impact a lot of businesses. So thank you all very much for coming Look along, guys. Um, really Thanks, appreciate Johnny, I hope there was some really good value in it for you as well there. <coughs> and we look forward to seeing you at our next one in September and a very big month. There'll be more announcements coming up and a very big month for Small Business Month in October with workshops every week on a variety of topics coming up too. Um, thank you, Trevor. Thank you, guys. Thanks.